Today on Rambling About Cars, we drive the new 2024 Ford Mustang. We tease the new U.S. spec Toyota Land Cruiser. We discuss the new Mitsubishi pickup truck. We discuss Honda S2000 electric rumors. Yet we've heard them too. And folks, our first ever million dollar cheap car challenge is tonight. So let's roll. It's podcast time. I am Christopher Smith. Mr. Chris Bruce is across the way, and we are not alone. Why don't you tell everybody who we've got with us today? We have got Brett T. Evans, MotorOne.com senior editor with us tonight. Brett, go ahead and the folks know you. You've been on this and you've been on the happy hour many times. But if there's anything you want to say, go ahead and feel free to say it. Uh, my favorite color is baby blue. Brett Evans okay. from MotorOne.com. That's totally appropriate. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's fair. Baby blue. I'm a big fan of blue myself. We can work with that. Sure. Um, as we give people just a few minutes to jump onto the program, we do have a nice, I feel like we have a really nice, varied program because we've got cars, we we've got SUVs or SUV, we've but, got pickup truck. Wait, I, I, so this is the thing, since we're waiting for people to come on and waiting for people to show up in the room, I think this is the perfect opportunity for Brett to talk about his project vehicle. His that project you can SUV. read about that you can and read about at motorone.com. I will pull that up right now. Brett, why don't you tell us about it a second? Um, yeah, it was a kind of a weird happenstance. My brother bought a uh, 1996 Lexus LX450, which is the 80 series Toyota Land Cruiser on um, Cars and Bids a few months ago. And it was local to me. So I went out and picked it up for him. Um, and when I got there, it just wasn't in the condition that it was described. And so we talked to the owner and the owner owner gave him some money back, but it kind of just soured the whole experience for him. He just was not. So, um, I drove it home. He owned this car. It was his, yeah, there it is right there. He, yep. He'd already purchased it. And so, um, I drove it home and, um, on the like 90 minute drive home, I was like, I really like this thing. Uh, my, my boyfriend was following behind me and he drove it around the block a few times and he felt the same way. And we we're both like, shoot. I mean, we, we were looking for a car to kind of like do a little bit more um, camping and, and, you know, hiking and stuff like that. So we thought maybe this is the one. So we bought it for my brother and, and uh, kind of have been on the process of baselining it. So it's not going to be a big full off-road overland build. Um, we're just going to kind of get it to like a baseline daily driver, you know, reliable, comfortable kind of level. And it's been a whole lot of fun. Nice. So far, Very cool. Uh, so far, we've had the uh, mechanic take care of the front axle needed to be resealed. So we had a mechanic do that as well as do the um, the oil pans. And then we, a couple weeks ago, we just did the uh, the um, valve cover gasket and spark plugs and, and some of the supporting maintenance there. And then... Um, this this latest installment that we have is on uh, tires. We got a new set of, uh, of Firestone Destination tires on it that, honestly, like compared to the twelve year old rubber that was on it, transformed the way that it drove. It's amazing. Like you can't compare old and new from like a traction standpoint, or you can't compare the tires before and after just because the old rubber was so terrible. And so like now I like people sometimes say, oh you know what's a good tire to buy and i'm like whatever it is just get new ones like if your tires are old <laughs> just get new tires oh that's like fingernails on a chalkboard to me go ahead go ahead i mean I, I i don't know what your tires look i don't know how old your tires are these were 13 years 12 or 13 years old and they were dry rotted and cracked and like i put these destination xts on it they're a much more aggressive tread pattern so i was expecting them to be louder and to ride worse and everything like that it was amazing how much better the thing drives with new tires on it. So um, well, yeah, it's, it's been a fun project. I'm with you a thousand percent on getting the new tires. And for as long as I've been alive and as many cars as I've owned in that time, I am still at this point amazed every time I get a new set of tires because it always makes such a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been hanging around Jonathan Benson too long from tire reviews. I've gotten to the point now where it's like, Ooh, not just any new tire works. Uh, there are there are amazing differences just between oh, the sure. brands. Um, not that my 2004 Subaru Forester is the off-road superstar that this Lexus is, and this thing just looks amazing and and awesome in every way. 
But last weekend, I finally had a chance to really kind of exercise the Forester in some off-road conditions where I was going down some so, some pretty sketchy trails, and I was in some pretty deep sand at some points. And uh, I have a set of Falcon Wild Peaks that I put on it earlier this year. And, yeah, they're I, awesome. I've had it, Falcon it, it Wild just Peaks goes. before. They're, they're great tires. And that's a – yeah, agreed. That's a great car. I know tons of people who get into really, like – my favorite thing in the world to do is to drive up a trail that feels really difficult and challenging and then get to the top and there's a bone stock Subaru Outback up there. Like I love, I love it when that happens. So those are yeah. tough cars. Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to Moab anytime soon, but I, I felt very vindicated because I mean, it's a small, fairly light all wheel drive. I mean, I don't have locking diffs and all of that stuff. So if things get really, really squirrely, yeah, I, I would run into trouble. But at my age, if I reach that point, I'm just calling AAA. Like, yeah, just come on <laughs> here with your truck. Yeah. Tell me back to where I can get some traction. <laughs> so quick teaser before we move on to the news. Um, the uh, Lexus LX is the the cousin, I think it would be fair to say, maybe step sibling to the Toyota Land Cruiser. And we will be mm -hmm. talk, talking about the new Toyota Land Cruiser here in just a little bit. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, stay tuned. I was comparing dimensions and they're actually very similar. So I'm very excited for the new, not not oh. the new Land Cruiser, but the new GX. Dimensions between right. this, my LX and the new GX are very similar. So I'm pretty stoked for what the Land Cruiser is going to bring to the table. Yeah, cool. well, I mean, it's like everything else over the years. The cars have gotten a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm pretty stoked, too, to, to see how the new smaller Land Cruiser, if you will, um, is going to fare here for the United States. Um, and just a quick shout out. We're live right now. If you're listening to us, you know we're live right now. Motor One Com on Facebook. Motor One Com on Twitter. Motor One on YouTube, and if you can't catch us live, the podcasts go up on all the audio platforms, Apple, Amazon, Deezer, iHeartRadio, something, 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 like a dozen or so audio platforms. They go up every Friday, 1030 a.m. They're, they're always up by 10 or 1030 a.m. on Friday. We'd mm -hmm. love to have you live because you can comment. You can jump into the comments. Join us in the chat right now live. And with that in mind, we're about to talk about the 2024 Mustang, and we, we don't are. have we don't have new news because this thing debuted well, almost a year ago. But but no, we have new news in the fact that Brett actually got to drive one. And yes, the drivers are than finally a coworker of ours. He is the first guy I've known to get to drive one. And he is certainly the first person on the show to get to drive one. Right. So it's, we have it's been a long questions for him. It's been a long buildup. I mean, the, the car debuted last September and uh, I mean, we're finally getting around to media drive. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, we're, we're on the bad list or anything. It just took this long for the media drives to commence. Yeah. Um, so Brett, I know there's been and Bruce, if it's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the jump here because I'm a Mustang guy. Yeah. I've got one in the yeah, garage. Take, yeah, 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 um, man. Go for it. There's been considerable discussion since the seventh gen came out that well, the four says it's all new, but it's I mean, it's kind of really not. It still pretty much has the same bones underneath. There's there's some fresh styling on the outside. Does it really feel like a new generation Mustang? I think that's the, the first question that people want to know. There's definitely a lot of commonalities. The suspension layout's very similar. Um, you know, most of the body mount, the hard mounting points are the same. So there's obviously some similarities when you really get structural. But um, no, I mean, you'd never, you would never, if you weren't an anorak looking for those details in a Mustang, you would never know that it wasn't a brand new, all completely, totally revised from the ground up generation because Ford has just done so much to differentiate this car. The comment that you just had pinned was uh, was really, yeah, there we go. That was uh, re that's really prescient. I mean, how um, how vastly different the interior experience is compared to the previous generation is, I mean, it's astounding. It's it's so much more modern inside there, for better and for worse. I agree with uh, Ted Adam Green here that I oh no, he doesn't miss the dual arcs. I do miss the dual arcs. I, I kind of miss that twin cowl design, but. Um, but Ford is being very bold and being very like modern with 
this with this new car, at least in everything that you interact with. It's all very modern and updated. For, for the listeners out there, let me just read the comment. Um, and this is why right, you should this is why you should jump on and join us live because you can comment live and interact here. Ted Adam Green, longtime Rambler, awesome, always, always, always to see you. Ted Adam Green says the new interior is asymmetrical, but so was my Fox body Mustang. So I don't miss the dual arcs in the cockpit. That's what we're talking about with the dual arcs, of course. The new Mustang, very asymmetrical. You've got those screens in there. Brett, did you get a chance to drive? Uh, a car with the single, you know, with with the two screens behind the one glass, and then the screen separate. Because I know when we finally saw one of the lower spec Mustangs that had the driver yeah. display and then the center display separate, it looked kind of awkward. We didn't we didn't get to drive one of the ones with the uh, with the base layout. Um, they did okay. have one for display, like sitting. Um, in the the hotel where we were staying for the drive they did have one set up for display um it doesn't look nearly as uh as integrated as the as the you know the flagship spec one does but it's not it's not terrible in person it doesn't really look any different from from the uh you know most of the other premium cars these days that have a similar setup so um definitely uh you know still kind of stands out still shows that like you know base mustang buyers are still going to get a much different um experience than they ever have in the past that's just like loaded with customizability and technology and so i like the comments quick. oh go ahead uh, yeah i was going to call this out from frequent commenter Grupa fbc who brett he is from australia and um he commented the fox body instrument panel graphic option is not only fantastic but it shows how much simple clarity and visual communication is missing from current displays and d were you able to experience that because obviously the new mustang has multiple display options on its digital instrument cluster and one of them is kind of the throwback fox yeah. body look um were you able to take a look at that yeah and it i mean it looks exactly like it does in all the all the photos that you've seen of it it's really really cool it um looks just very you know understated and sleek and the coolest part about it is even though the display is it's already it's a digital display it's already lit up so mm -hmm. it's not like the display needs to change but when you do turn on the headlights when you go like you know when when the sun goes down the um illumination behind the gate just turns green just like it does in the box box <laughs> wow, so, you that's know cool that's like, a it, nice it touch obviously doesn't need to but it does anyway right. and it's just kind of a fun thing it's... that, that Ford is doing to kind of really bring it back a little bit. So that is a very fun touch. And I love how the tachometer, you still get like that, the yellow zone, like you're getting yeah. close to red line. It, the yellow zone comes in at what, like about like five or 5,500 or so. And it's like the engine still has a long way to go on this guy. The Fox with the old five liter push rod. Yeah. You were, you were getting close to the limit, yeah. but not with this one. This, the, this new coyote, um, what, Red lines at seventy five hundred, I think. Seventy five, yeah. It's an out like for being not a particularly exotic engine, it is an outrageously high revving machine. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. You can also tell in that in these two photos, you can tell that there's a hatch mark on the fifty five mile per hour mark as well, which I love. That's <laughs> adorable. That is that is ultimate eighties right there. Yeah. Uh, for the younger listeners out there, back when the United States had the nationally mandated fifty five mile an hour speed limit. I believe it was required by automakers at that point to highlight 55 miles an hour in the yeah. instrument cluster. And, and I, I believe and, there was also an 85 mile per hour speed lip yes. limit limit. You could not have a speed a speedometer that went over 85 miles per hour. Right. So. The cars, the, the cars could go faster granted in the eighties, not necessarily much faster. Um, uh, but yeah, the that's why you see 85 mile an hour speedometers from that era. That's all automakers were allowed to put on there. So I mean, the running joke was it's like, yeah, I'm I don't know how fast I'm going. It's like it's like three or four inches past 85, right? <laughs> so we always like to call out new commenters and Cola. I don't think we've seen you commenting before, Welcome. if I'm mistaken. But yeah, we love to call out new commenters. So Cola said, new Mustang is very good overall. Keep the segment alive. But this new gen is a major upgrade. Overall, I guess people have no choice since the Challenger, Charger, and Camaro are all dead. So uh, well, and, thank you, Cola. And you know, We'd love yeah. to get comments from yes, especially thanks, from new listeners. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Rambler family. Um, 
This isn't the first time the Mustang has been solo. Um, 2002, no. the Camaro was the last year for the Camaro for a while. And then you had uh, you had the tail yeah. end of the new edge there, 03 and 04. And then you had all the way up from 2005 up through uh, 2009. Sure. Um, or the Challenger came back in what, 08, somewhere around there? You had no, the Challenger it was earlier than that, wasn't it? You, you had the Challenger and the Camaro come back pretty close together, so there were a few years where the I Mustang it was like had everything more like on 06 its own. Six in my mind, but it could, could be 06 or 07. It, it could be okay. earlier than that. Um, yeah, I, th- I, I think I, I think you're right. High school when they first came out, so I think it was 06. I, I I think you're right. You were still in high school in 06. Damn it, I Bruce. I was still in high. Uh, well, you and I are 10 years apart, buddy. Yeah, yeah, 10 years apart. It uh, it catches up to you. But yeah, point B, there were a few years the yeah. Mustang was solo, and it didn't suck. So no. Hopefully, <laughs> no, it didn't. Ho- hopefully Ford won't be like, yeah, we won this one, and kick back and just and just let things go like, like they've done from time to time. Um, yeah, it's funny, because it kind of seems like Ford does their biggest like leaps forward with the Mustang when they're in the competition. Right? Like the 2005 Mustang was a was a big. It finally did away with the Fox chassis and all this other mm-hmm. stuff, and and it had no competition. Ford had no reason to to keep the segment that that vibrant and interesting right. in 2005. So you know, well, and, and even the same. and even prior to that, um, you know, you had the 03, the SVT Cobra, that yeah. uh, up to up to that point, the Camaro was just was just kind of reigning supreme in the power world. And Ford, they finally decided to put a supercharger on the Cobra, um, and then they underrated it. So that it was like about 400, 425 horsepower. It was rated at 390, just as the Camaro went away. So, yeah. It was it, a 12-second car in 2003. It was oh, that, that Those things were insane. Just just insane. Um, but speaking of power here, um, tell us a little bit about your driving experiences. We've talked here about the aesthetics. Um what is this thing like to drive? Because I've heard lots, lots of reports on the steering. Do you have and specifically I mean, tell, tell us a which, little bit? Which models did you drive? Yeah, did you not drive because obviously there's the GT, there's the EcoBoost, there's the Dark mm-hmm. Horse, etc. I've got a squeaky dog. Hold on, just a second. Nothing wrong. No, keep going. Okay. We love squeaky dogs. We'll, we'll, we'll get, get we'll get Cooper in. If you want one? We'll get Cooper in on the discussion. Yeah, um, he's over there. I I actually drove um, all pretty much all four variants: the EcoBoost and GT oh. Coupe and Convertible. So um, okay, but no Dark Horse, no Dark, no dark Horse, right? Horse. Okay, no, we've got okay. we've got uh, Jeff right now is driving the Dark Horse. Yes, and he'll have he'll have uh, impressions next week. So be sure to keep keep tuned to MotorOne.com for that. But um, sure. So I drove um, all of them and. You know, from like an all-around driving enjoyment perspective, I actually really enjoy the EcoBoost Coupe a lot. Like it, it's 250 pounds lighter, and most of that weight comes off of the front axle, so it really feels a lot more nimble and a lot more like the steering is much more direct and everything like that. Um, but um, they all drive really nicely. They're all very, you know, very enjoyable, sporty. Um, you know, plenty of power, obviously, um, and it was just it was a really kind of like a comprehensive good driving experience. I think I heard you inferring a little bit that there were some problems with the steering, and I definitely think that that's uh, true. I think the, um, especially, I noticed it especially on the GT um, convertible that I was driving, um, that um, the steering feels way overboosted. It's a little too light. Um, there's not, you don't, doesn't really require very much effort. Um, it's really direct and it's really quick. The steering ratio is quicker than it was for the last, uh, the last Mustang GT. Um, so that's nice that you kind of get a lot more direct turn in and everything like that. But um, feedback, just there's no feedback whatsoever. And mm. kind of in the middle of a corner when you feel like the most the most weight transferring and the most cheese and everything like that, that's really where you want to know exactly what the tires are doing. And the Mustang mm-hmm. just doesn't communicate that to you at all. So um, from like a dynamic perspective, that was my biggest complaint. Otherwise, though, I, I really just – I it was just kind of like a very enjoyable and fun driving experience. The sound of the engine alone is worth the cost of entry in my mind. Like it just is such a brilliant, that 7,500 RPM um, red line is incredible. And the, the thing just shrieks all the way to the top. Like I would never expect, I mean, this thing's a cross plane crank. 
It's not supercharged and it just screams. It's an absolute whaler all the way to the red line. It's so brilliant and it sounds so good. Um, so that was obviously just a really exciting and enjoyable driving experience right then and there without, without even needing to turn a wheel. Um, and it really is just a really enjoyable, fun sport coupe. I probably wouldn't put it in the same category as like a, you know, BMW M4, but it's also not nearly as expensive That's, and it's, yeah. it's, it's not fighting for the same enthusiast heart as something like that would be. It's, it's brilliant. It's a, it's a great little sports car for sure. Well, so if I can play devil's advocate for just a second, um, do you think <clears throat> that maybe Ford set up the steering, especially for that convertible GT that you were talking about, that they set it up more of kind of an overboosted setup because it would be more comfortable for, you know, someone who's not going to take this on the track. Someone who just, you know, it, it would be a grand touring cruiser that you would just kind of take yeah. around something like that. Do you, do you think that's possible? What, that was, what do you think? that was my suspicion. And I sat down with a Ford engineer um, at dinner after a drive. And I asked, so the, the cars that I drove, I drove a GT with the performance package and then a GT convertible with the performance package. Okay. And I asked um, if the tuning is different suspension and steering between the convertible and the coupe to account for greater weight, you know, less structural mm -hmm. flexibility sure. or less structural rigidity, everything like that. And he said that they were actually tuned, um, pretty much the same, that they don't really do oh, um, body specific. Really? And, and they do that because um, they think that the convertible, the structure of the convertible is stiff enough that it can kind of cope with with uh, the, the settings for the coupe. And it's that's not entirely true. You definitely see some cowl shake in the convertible. You kind of see the windshield um, header wibbling around a little bit over really bad pavement. But, you know, it is still a pretty, pretty like the car itself, you know, beyond the windshield is a, is a pretty stiff structure. So I kind of buy... I kind of buy the, the the marketing speak there a little bit. Um, so, and I, you know, to be fair, I didn't actually um, experience that much of a difference when I was driving the coupe, you know, hard and fast. Oh, okay. It still felt, it didn't feel, that it felt a little bit more um, direct for sure. Like when you turn the wheel, the action happens more immediately because there's less flex in the body. But, sure. um, but you know, the feel, the, um, the weighting felt very similar. There was, you know, a similar amount of, feedback which is to say not very much um through the wheel um but i i really do think that like you know to your point chris um i don't i don't think that many average mustang customers are going to care that much about how much feel you get through the steering um there's going to be a shelby version coming soon i'm sure of it they haven't confirmed that but i'm sure that there's going to be a shelby version coming soon there's still the mustang dark horse which which jeff drove today and we get to find out what he thought about it in a couple of days there's all these you know, potential variants for people who do want really direct, really, you know, precise, lots of feedback, everything like that. Um, and for them, there's, there's those cars, but for the average person who just wants a really fun, enjoyable V8 soundtrack and, and, you know, in my opinion, very attractive, very like Mustang appropriate styling. I, I think the, the GT and the EcoBoost are both great options. You know, it's it's a great point um, as you're talking about various trims. I mean, we are at, I mean, not not to say that a fifty thousand dollar six speed V eight for an engine rear wheel drive car with four hundred and eighty or four hundred eighty six horsepower, depending on if you get that's not entry level. But it, but I wonder if Ford is leaving room for like dark horse for uh, for Shelby's for other vehicles like that. Um, to offer that that more uh, connected experience. It sort of reminds me of when the C8 Corvette first came out and people were like, oh, this thing has has a bunch of understeer dialed into it, you know, and this this is not a very good car. And it's like, well, the, the entry level, the, the base C8 Corvette Stingray is the car that the people are going to buy. They just want to drive around and say, I have a Corvette. And a lot of those people may not have experienced a mid-engine car before that has a very different driving dynamic from the Corvettes they're used to. So, you know, dial in a little bit of safety. I, I, I'm curious if that's the case here, but to, to jump back to the convertible having pretty much the same tuning and they feel it's stiff enough. I'm just thinking now, granted, my Mustang in the garage is much, much, much older, but the first thing I did when I got that car was get a set of frame connectors welded underneath 
And don't you think it made all the difference in the world? Sure. It's still probably the best mod I've done so far. And I'd be really curious to see how a new convertible feels with some extra bracing underneath it. I agree. I think that would be kind of an interesting experiment to kind of like use some of that uh, old school hot rod hot rod tech to to try and bolster up a new car to see if it makes as much of a difference as it does in the, in the older stuff. I mean, when you lop the roof off, there's you're you're losing something there. I feel like I mean, I feel like there has to be something extra added. I'm sure they add more, you know, there's probably an extra X brace and the, the, mm -hmm. the rear seats don't fold down as they do on the coupe. So there might be some bracing. So some extra seat. bracing in there for sure. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, my mom has a 2008 Mustang convertible mm -hmm. and um, she bought that while I was working at a Mercedes dealer and I would drive, you know, in very quick succession, I'd go from her Mustang to um, like a 2008, 2009 CLK convertible. And the difference, like her car was much stiffer than even the, the, the Mercedes is were of the era. So I think that they, I think that Ford takes it pretty seriously. Um, you know, at least with the, uh, the post Fox body, post Fox chassis era, I think they take, you know, structural rigidity a lot more seriously than maybe they did in the eighties and nineties. I really hope so. Because I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying my SN was like ready to twist in half. Now, I did have a Fox body convertible that just just jiggled like jello everywhere it went. And I didn't have any connectors on that. Um, I mean, they, they definitely they definitely upped it uh, through the 90s. And uh, I, I have actually not had the chance to drive a newer Mustang convertible beyond my 95. But I've driven the newer Mustangs with the hard tops. And I've always felt that they felt just surprisingly buttoned down. Um, and and good grand tours yeah. too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean it definitely fits the the uh, trim level for sure. That was kind of my that was kind of my abiding thought when we were driving um, the the coupe after after lunch was just like this is a car that I would just love to take the scenic route everywhere I went, and I wouldn't necessarily need to be going ten tenths. I wouldn't need to be going racetrack speeds. Just like a brisk, enjoyable pace, you know, third or fourth gear the whole way. And, and enjoying the sound of the engine and the reasonably smooth ride and just kind of having a good time without feeling like I was lighting anyone else's hair on fire. Well, here's a question that I'll ask that might not be on everybody's mind, but as somebody who's driven long distance in these cars, is this something that would be comfortable enough to jump in and, I mean, it, just take it for a three or four day trip covering several hundred miles? I mean doing the gt thing the grand touring thing yeah i think so um i i didn't really have any major comfort complaints um the seat is a little bit high and i feel like that's been a mustang tradition since like forever like it just is always i feel i feel like i can never get low enough in a mustang cockpit um so the seat's a little bit high that might get a little tiresome after a while um the recar the optional recaro seats that you can get in the coupe are fantastic they are um they're you know totally like totally bolstered and well su and supportive and everything like that um and there's still enough enough padding that you can kind of get comfortable i could definitely see myself spending you know five or six hours pretty easily back there or uh, you know in those seats um and then um you know not that it's a huge consideration for many mustang shoppers but it's incredible amount of trunk space in this thing i you know like even in the convertible you get 10 cubic feet which is a ton more than you get in even the coupe Camaro. So, you know, if you are one of those people who's going to take it on a long trip, like you can at least bring a lot of stuff with you. Um, the only other thing that I might uh, see getting a little bit tiresome is um, in the EcoBoost, it was an EcoBoost convertible. So um, obviously like sound deadening is not as good as it would be in a coupe. But, um, and I wasn't sure if it was a weird like arrow effect coming off of the roof or if it was the exhaust, but there was this really obnoxious like resonant thrum at like any speed above 55 or 60 that I, it just, it sounded like wind buffeting against, I, against like, you know, an open window or something like that. And it was just really obnoxious. I'm not sure if it was because we had the top up or, you know, maybe our, we had the, it had the active exhaust on it. So um, it might've been, you know, triggered into some kind of like aggressive mode that we weren't intending, even though we had it set to normal, um, you know, it might've been doing like a full throttle, you know, active trigger or something, but, um, otherwise I, 
the, especially in the GT, like it just, it was a pussycat. It was a great, comfortable, smooth, you know, just, it felt like a great sports car. I don't, I don't really know what else to say. It was just very well-rounded and, and, and cohesive. Can I ask one more question? Cause I know we're, we're, we're 30 minutes in here. Um, was there anything that surprised you on, on, on your drives, either between the EcoBoost or, or the GT? Yeah, of course. Um, the EcoBoost, I, I'll, I've got two surprises to, to share. The EcoBoost is um, very, very nimble. Uh, you see the spec chart and you see 3,500 pounds and you kind of wonder, you know, is this just kind of like a big, you know, it's not, you know, it's definitely not Miata size. So you kind of have to view it with some degree of skepticism. The EcoBoost is so incredibly nimble. We drove, all the ones that we drove had the high performance package. So it meant you got um, Pirelli P0 tires and uh, stiffer um, anti-roll bars and, and a revised suspension setup. So obviously we were driving cars that were purpose built for handling, but the, it, it did very, very well. We had an autocross course and then like a twisty road Canyon drive. And it was so easy to control and you you felt a lot of um like the suspension was very communicative you definitely kind of just felt very in control of the car and then the limits are um pretty reasonably reasonably approached because it doesn't have the overwhelming power of the gt so it really just feels very very balanced and very comfortable um that was one really positive surprise that i had about the eco boost um the gt you can call this one you know maybe a mixed blessing um it felt a little bit short on torque when you were down low in the rev range. Like if you were on the highway in, in fifth or sixth gear and you rolled onto the throttle, you didn't really feel much until the tack got to about 3000 RPM. So that was kind of a surprise <laughs> on, on the, on the negative side. The upswing to that though, is the way that it screams from 3000 to 7,000 is incredible. I mean, just like this brilliant rush of power and torque, for that wide of a rev range, it's a bummer that you don't get it down low. But again, I, I kind of think that that's a, you know, a symptom of, of like a lot of Ford V8s. I know like the modular 4.6 V8 was similar. Like it just, it screamed really, really well, um, but maybe was lacking some of the down low that you get in like an LS motor. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a mixed, definitely kind of a mixed blessing. I, I found myself really enjoying it. It was a surprise, but I found myself just really enjoying that like high RPM thrill. Um, that you got okay. in the GT. So if I can chime in here one second. So Smith, thank you very much. You put up Cola's thing. New Mustang is not enough, in my opinion. It needs more power and more performance. And I was looking this up because uh, Cola, I know you're a first time commenter, but that doesn't mean I can't push against you. The Austin Martin DB9, which I think we can all agree is kind of a a benchmark, not in terms of style and performance you know it kind of combines both of those things it had let me look double check this here it had 450 horsepower and uh 420 pound feet of torque the mustang that we're talking about now with a v8 486 horsepower which is more 418 pound feet of torque which is a bit less but still saying that it doesn't have enough power to me is absurd. I, I, well, I, I, I can't co-sign with that. I, I, well, like, well, like Brett was just talking about, you know, the, the power peak, it feels like it's pretty high in this car. When you're, when you're in a, a big old American V8 like that, you tend to get used to just, it doesn't matter what gear, man, all those roll on the throttle, the torque will get me going and then I'll really get pinned. When, when, when it gets up in the range with a horsepower. Um, okay. so I, I mean, there might be a little something there. Um, and keep in mind, like we said earlier, this is just the starting point. We still have, we still have Shelby's to come. Um, the right. dark horse That's already, choice. the dark horse already there is 500 horsepower. Um, and as somebody who's driven plenty of 400, 500 horsepower cars, they're plenty fast. Um, you get much beyond that. And, and I will, I will argue this point to my grave. Um, unless you're talking about something weighing 5,000 pounds, yeah, unless you're talking about a semi truck, <laughs> when, when, when you start getting up into 500 horsepower or so that sweet spot for me is five to 600 horsepower. 
that's that's really that's that's a nice good usable amount for a street driven car you'll still blow up the tires in first if you have a good set of tires and a decent suspension you'll you'll be able to lay it down in second you'll be able to enjoy the power um anything See, beyond my that is 300 that's where i put and, and everyone can disagree like there's well Everyone anything anything beyond the, that, right. 300 yeah. is my number. 500, sure, is yours. Brett, I'm sure you have a different number than us, but, you know. Be, beyond that, your traction control is going to be constantly kicking in. Yeah. Unless you turn it unless you turn it off, in which case you're just blowing the tires up because you're not getting traction. Or if you're in a Mustang, you're spinning Yuri's out. A and, 700, and, which and, I disagree and crashing, with. But and crashing into okay. crowds, as you do in a Mustang. Um, if, if you're at a track, Hey, go ahead, crank up the power where you can really, I mean, you get on, you get on some good straights, you could roll on it in third or fourth gear where you're really feeling that 700 horsepower below that on the street. You're just not feeling it. The traction control is going to cut in or you're going to be modulating the throttle, or you might experience it for a second or two before you're doing ridiculously triple digit speeds that should not be undertaken on the street so i mean that's great that, that that's kind of my point there we still got a ways to go with mustang we know there will be more powerful yeah. variants oh, coming of course the, it's the new generation there's going to be a shelby like if there's not a shelby version i would be shocked and there, ford if you're be... listening and you better damn well be listening you're you are fools 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 did i say fools i said fools you are fools Fools, if you don't do an SVO, oh, take that, I, yeah. you and take I that ego left. boost, Brett. Yeah. You were talking about how much lighter, nimbler it feels. You lose two hundred fifty pounds off the fronts. You and I did let's a whole let's get an, about that. Let's get an SVO with 400, 400 plus four hundred fifty horse. It doesn't need four hundred. It needs and, 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 a, and a thirty five. It would be fine. And a thirty five, thirty six hundred pound car with a much better weight distribution. That would be a tremendously fun Mustang. And as long as it has the biplane spoiler. Sure. Oh, there you go. Go go yeah. classic 80s no with the biplane me. spoiler. There you go. I th I think that's I mean, that's just a no-brainer in my head. It really is. Um, turn that four cylinder up a little bit. And I know people say Mustangs yeah. have to have V8s. Well, yes, the V8 is known for the Mustang, but the Mustang, since its very, very, very beginnings, has always offered different engines. It has. It's it's an iconic fact factor that goes into the Mustang, but it's not a defining characteristic. I mean, so let's a, get a four let's get a big has been a part of the Mustang formula for twenty years of the Mustang's existence. Like in oh, more than so, that, if the Fox body had a four was, cylinder. It was what the, uh, the oh yeah you could go you four to ninety five or seventy four to ninety three and then again from two thousand fifteen mm -hmm. on I think it's something uh, like that. okay okay then in that yep. yes yeah the way you explained like, it yes you're right it's like 20, yep. 28, 28 total years of the Mustang's fifty year history it has offered a four cylinder so and and six cylinders were around since the very beginning yeah literally since the very beginning <laughs> very beginning yeah so. Um, lots of discussion there on the Mustang. We're 40 minutes in. We should probably move on to some of the other things we have to talk probably about. Should. But, but Brett, I mean, you, it's awesome that you had a chance to drive these. It's great to get this feedback. Yeah. I'm super excited to, to get behind the wheel of one here eventually. But for now, let's talk about another vehicle that has everybody pretty excited right now. Smith, and can I add one little oh. bit more Mustang thing? Just super quick. No! Yes. Okay, go. Uh, to me, the Mustang, the beauty about the Mustang is that it can be all things to all people and that it can be you can build a Mustang as a track car. You can build a Mustang as a grand tour. You know, it can be a big V8 that just like takes you down the road at speed. You can pass cars and have no problems and it can be comfortable or it can be a track car with a super stiff suspension. You can be passing people all the time and whatever. And that's the beauty of it. And it's always been that way since literally day one that and you could outfit a Mustang to be whatever it is you want to be. So and that's now all I had to say. you can have it with four doors room in the front to carry a bunch of shrimp to your cocktail parties, because that's what Mustang people do. 
when we I, go to Mustang to meets, we fill the shrimp guy. We Mustang. fill we fill our trunks with shrimp, and we pop this. This goes back to like media. Uh, it was like a media photo thing that Ford did when the Mach E first came mm-hmm. out. And they were like, "Look at all the fun things you can do!" And one of them was like they filled the trunk with shrimp, yep. and it's just like Ford, my God. There's not one single Mustang owner in the entire universe that is thinking, I'm going to fill my trunk with food unless it's in a cooler. Anyway. Well, that's well. that's the whole deal. It's a drainable, lockable trunk. It's a cooler. It's perfect. Yeah, I still ain't putting perfect shrimp in it. For, perfect for your raw meats and seafood. <laughs> yeah. Your raw that's, meats and cheeses. That's, when, when we go to Carlisle or Mustang Week, that's exactly... Oh, my God, you found it, Bruce. You pulled it up right away. That's even the article I wrote, too. Ford loses mind, fills monk, Mustang Maki frunk with shrimp. Because that's what Mustang people do. Gross. Yeah. A Mustang can be everything. It could be a shrimp <laughs> delivery device, it or it could be a quarter-mile pounder. It can be everything. Guys, let's talk about the Land Cruiser teasers because we're going to run out of time. Um, and well, they, 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 we're called rambling about cars for a reason. We should I, I, Maybe we should call it rambling off the rails about cars. Uh, but Toyota Land Cruiser, you're like, well, the, a new one just came out a couple years ago. Well, yes, it's not sold in the United States unless you consider the, the Lexus variant, which is sold here. Um, but the Land Cruiser name is coming back to North America and it's been teased and we got some pretty significant teasers on it today. Um, and, and by pretty significant, okay, we're we're getting a flavor, a little bit of what it's going to look like where nothing, I want to say, I want to stress, nothing is confirmed at this point. Um, but it's most likely going to be based on the Lexus GX, uh, which is what Brett was allu- alluding to earlier, which means it's going to be a little bit smaller. And I, I think that makes sense uh, to go with the just just the history of the Land Cruiser, its capabilities. You could certainly do a lot more with something a little bit smaller. Um, and we just got quite a few pictures uh, that we added into the post. And Brett, you actually wrote this up. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about why this is kind of a big deal here. Yeah. Um, so a lot of these photos were found, you know, overnight while I was fast asleep. But before <laughs> before I wrote the uh, I wrote the post to um, one specific teaser that Toyota themselves released um, under embargo. Um, and you can kind of see um, there's definitely some like retro design cues, um, mm-hmm. especially up front. You get a tiny little hint of it in that in that headlight view. But then um uh, the front end has like a very, you know, kind of traditional blocky square um, grill with the retro Toyota wordmark instead of the Jelly Bean logo. Um, so you definitely are seeing some kind of like a return to like old school Toyota, you know, off-roading goodness, which is fun. That's always always good to see. Um, and then um, these next teasers that um, that uh, Bruce up there found and added to the gallery. These were posted on Toyota's Japanese website and um, kind of like talking about the 2024 Land Cruiser. And you can definitely see a ton more detail in there, which is, which is awesome. And I, I would have, you know, I am really happy that he spotted these in time. Um, one feature that I really love is the taillight. I don't know so, if this is real quick, in- full credit, yeah, because it. I'm going to take credit for something that's on Adrian, our boss, ah. found them. And then I was kind of the one that said, we really got to put these on. The hey, we, yeah, we, we really should. And it, uh, yeah, it, it seemed like everybody wanted to see him. So yeah. Yeah. Good, good team effort. Yeah. I, what, I mean, the base, the first thing that you can clearly tell though, is that it's definitely going to be a smaller vehicle than, than the, mm-hmm. uh, Land, the last time we had a Land Cruiser sold here was yes. the 200 series. And that was a big Sequoia base or not Sequoia base, but it was Sequoia sized and, mm-hmm. you know, had a big, um 5.7 liter v8 was just a kind of a hulking machine and you can you can tell just from these photos alone that this is going to be a much smaller more um accessibly sized off-roader which is definitely befitting the land cruisers brand history and heritage here and and one thing that came in with these teasers um aside from the outside we got one glimpse of the center console where we were able to see some four-wheel drive controls and I know we were talking about that a little bit just in our in our chat here today. 
about what some of those could mean, just to some of the various locking differentials, some of the features that might be available on there, which which I don't know that that a lot of other news outlets picked up on, but uh, I felt like that was a pretty significant little teaser here. Um, I mean, Seth, I don't know that a lot of other news outlets realized that there were additional photos on the Japanese press site or not yeah. Japanese press site, Japanese promo site, I should say. Yeah. But so, yeah. so I mean, so, we, we, go ahead, go ahead. We've got H4F and we talked about this in our chat and we're not a thousand percent sure what these various things mean, but we've kind of got a speculation. H4F might be high four wheel drive full time for full time all wheel drive. H4L we're thinking is high, high range four wheel drive with a locking center differential, which is something that the Lexus GX has. And then L4L for low range four wheel drive with the locking center differential. And again, we're not sure this, this is the image we have, but um, I could pull up the image from the Lexus GX and it only has two options. It has H4 and L4. Mm -hmm. Whereas it looks like this is going to have that additional H4L option. Right. Um, and the, the difference here is that the Lexus, it does have the two options, but it has a button that you can press for the locking center differential. Yes. Um, so so I, it could just be that Toyota is doing without that button. And it's just kind of letting you choose between, you know, whether you want your traditional like all wheel drive style, full time four wheel drive, or if you want that locked center differential to kind of like... Mm -hmm preempt traction loss before it happens yeah right and again but we don't know yet for sure but we definitely have this image and we have this you know nomenclature these letterings and we just have to kind of go off of that so we don't we don't know but i you well, know and we've again, all been writing about cars from, for a while and I'm these sorry, also ahead, came Brent. from the japanese website so you know yes. even if even if we are conjecturing right now it is about a japanese product mm -hmm. that you know, Toyota has announced, they've officially announced that there is a new Land Cruiser coming and it will be revealed on August 1st. Mm -hmm. And if it has anything to do with this Japanese car that we're talking about right here, great. But, you know, we, but we do need to kind of clarify that these are yep. taken from the Japanese, not the USA website. Totally. Yep. Right. That's very good um, to make. <clears throat> But it's also nice to know that we don't have long to try to figure this out. It'll be yeah. it'll be displayed. Well, <laughs> August 1st, it is what? July 26th right now. So As we're recording. We're yeah. Away. Just, just, just a few days away. Uh, and Cola comments, new Land Cruiser Prado is going to be an excellent vehicle, better than the Wrangler plus Bronco upcoming forerunner. And this Land Cruiser Prado are going to be good. I don't know. It's, it's, they all, um, appeal to different buyers, I think. And that's, what's glorious about them is that each one of them, does slightly different things and that's perfectly okay and they're all going to appeal to a different buyer and i think there are plenty of buyers for them all that's my opinion i don't know but yeah now i'm i feel like i'm getting some deja vu bruce didn't we have a very similar discussion when the lexus gx debuted <laughs> yes, because it because it we were so surprised pleasantly i might add yeah. At at the styling direction Lexus took with the with their GX, how it's just kind of chunky. And I think I was talking about, um, you know, are you going for this or the, you know, like a, a a Wrangler Unlimited, or I think I even mentioned G Class in there. Maybe maybe we talked Bronco too because it's it was like, I mean, are we really comparing Wrangler and Bronco to Lexus? But it was just the GX just kind of had that vibe going on, right? Sure. No, yeah, 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 you're right. And I think, you know, the, what we are, you know, we know it's a new Land Cruiser. We're assuming it's related to the Prado, but it, or the uh, GX, damn, if it doesn't look like it, like it, the, the evidence just keeps piling up and up and up and up. Yeah, <sighs> there's, there's definitely going to be some pretty obvious, uh, uh, connections between the two like that belt line right there you can see very clear up kick on the uh on the yep. on the rear mm -hmm. passenger door it's gonna it's it's gonna be a gx i don't you know yeah i i i think it's pretty safe to to make that uh to make that generalization i 
that that's one of those things where it's like, you know, it's not confirmed, but I mean, yeah. we have eyes. Yeah. It, re- um, it kind of reminds me of, I, sorry, folks, I, my Jeep nomenclature, I want to say it's JK Cherokee, but maybe that's XJ. the wrong nomenclature. XJ. Oh, maybe it is XJ. Um, it kind of reminds me of that, where it's a, it's not quite as luxurious as you know the grand cherokee that sits above it but it has every bit of the off-road chops and so hey i don't mind if i have to sit in cloth seats i don't you know i don't care about that but i have still have all of those mechanicals underneath me that you know i can still do rock crawling and stuff like that it's it feels like that's what this vehicle is going to be and that's yeah that's my biggest question is where they're going to be positioning it. Cause we don't, I, we don't have pricing on the GX yet either. So nope. we don't know if the GX nope, is don't. going to be like a, you know, it's uh, arguably uh, ostensibly going to be cheaper than the LX, which starts at 80 some odd thousand dollars. So, yeah. you know, GX may be somewhere in the sixties or seventies. It's probably going to compete right at the like defender 110, 130 market. Is this mm-hmm. going to be a defender 90 price, you know, 50 to 70, or is this going to be, um, you know, I mean, more like a Jeep or a Bronco, like 40 to 60. Um, I'm, I'm dying to see where they're going to position this and how they're going to differentiate it from uh, like 4Runner and, and uh, Sequoia TRD Pro. I'm, I'm dying to see where this car sits in their lineup. Agreed. Well, we won't yeah, have I long think... to wait. Right. We won't have long to wait. And um, uh, let me just give a quick shout out to Ted Adam Green, um, who comment on the same thing that I noticed. Why do foreign market cars have English words? on their car since we were saying that yes this is a japanese market car um i haven't been in many japanese market cars and by that i mean zero um but i believe the the writing is still generally the same across the board i can kind of answer this and ted adam green have you ever heard of lingua franca which was during the 17th and 16th century when french was considered the language of the world that's why it's a lingua language, Franca, French. That was the accepted language of everything in the world of, you know, these days, English for now, at least don't know how long that's going to last is the language of the world. So you would still put things in English. I taught school in Germany, my students in, you know, not great English whatsoever, but they could communicate, you know, they could say, can I go to the bathroom or, you know, something, you know, they couldn't have a, a, a philosophical conversation with me, but they could express very simple things in English with me. So that's why it's in English is that it's the lingua franca of the modern world. Well, and to that end, that's kind of a fairly recent development in Japanese cars, at least because I know, um, I know someone who has a 1994 Toyota Celsior, which is the Lexus yep. LS of our, like we got it as the LS, they got it as a Toyota yep. Celsior and his car, all of the, all of the buttons, the traction control button, everything is all in, um, in Japanese lettering. Right. And, and really, it's, so it's really kind of funny to, to watch. So it's like, I had no idea how to operate anything at all. I've got no idea how any of that works. So I think it is kind of a recent <laughs> development for Japanese market cars, but I was surprised by the same thing. I was I was there a couple of months ago um, with Honda, and all of the cars that they ferried us around in had, like, the radio dials were all in you know American uh, in English, like lettering and everything like that. Like, use the same the same markings as our American market Hondas do. It's very weird. Well, that might be a good segue since we're speaking about uh, about the Japanese market. There, let's talk here just briefly. Um, on the Mitsubishi L200, the Triton, depending on which market you're in, because that okay. just debuted today. And I think it's a pretty significant vehicle that could have a place in North America if Mitsubishi decides to bring it here. Because we're talking about, uh, I mean, it's it's a mid-sized truck, but it's got a new ladder frame underneath it. Um, and yeah. I and I feel like I feel like a lot of truck people are going to take it a lot more seriously. Not that the previous one was you know was sketchy but i feel like i feel like truck people are going to take this more seriously because it's got that ladder frame underneath it um i mean it, it's a pretty sizable truck it's it's got i think it has pretty i think it has decent looks um i don't know that i would call it oh, attractive no. yeah. but it's but it's 
it's I mean, rugged. It's, it's burly. Yeah, you know? it, it it has a real burly truck look. Um, the the new truck it has a couple different four wheel drive systems that you can choose from. One of them has seven drive modes, um, center locking diffs that can actually do a sixty forty split to the front and rear wheels if you need it, or run it just two wheel drive or run it four wheel drive. Um, there's a new 2.4 liter diesel engine. It's the only yep. engine that Mitsubishi is talking about right but now. It's available in three tunes. Right. It, it's like the uh, Chevrolet Colorado. It's available in three tunes. It starts at 148 horsepower, 243 pound feet. You can get the mid tune, which is 181 horsepower, 316 pound feet. Or the top tune here is 201 horsepower, 346 pound feet. It uses a six speed auto or a six speed manual shift by wire transmission and i would like to know a little bit more about that but you didn't get a lot of information from mitsubishi on that i mean it's a regular three pedal setup with with the with the lever in the middle uh but apparently it's it's electronically uh you know you know collected connected electronically would like to know a little bit more about that but the point is automatic or manual six speed is there um the interior is wonderfully analog. Did you guys notice that? We don't have Mitsubishi. They didn't offer details on the size of the touch screen, uh, you know, the center. Um, and I believe just that driver is still analog gauges. Uh, but it's it's a wonderfully analog interior. And I can't help but wonder if, okay, if we're seeing that with American brands, uh, Ford, uh, General Motors, Ram, where they're still offering a lot of analog controls because I think I think truck buyers are appreciating that a lot more. So mm-hmm. we're seeing we're seeing that in this truck, and of course um, we're looking at it now. Bruce, you wrote up uh, the article. Yes, yeah, I was just on, the, on the rally that. version. Yep, they're not only they announced the street version today, but they also announced the rally version. And um, I got to pull it up so I can get the correct name of the rally it's competing in. The Asia Cross Country Rally that runs from Thailand to Laos, and it starts in August. And apparently there are a lot of river crossings and water crossings during that event. And that's why it has that snorkel that goes all the way to the roof like sometimes <laughs> yep. you see it it just stops at the a pillar no, no 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 no. this one goes all the way to the roof just in case so apparently it's going through some fairly s- deep water from time to time um but yeah so they have a street version and they also have this rally version that if you're watching on youtube that we're seeing now that is rugged it has a different the rally version has a different suspension setup it has dual dampers front and back um it also gains um limited slip differentials at the front and back whereas the standard version only has a limited limited slip differential in the middle so you know bunch of extra parts the powertrain is actually the same it's still the same 2.4 liter turbo diesel it just has a bunch of extra parts for making sure that power goes down to the right place and as group fbc points out uh nissan underneath it, it's i mean yeah there's there's strong family ties here to the nissan navara yeah. um and it is on sale can you guys believe this an automaker debuts a vehicle that you could buy right now not in a year and a half are you listening, Hyundai? It's available right now. Um, it's on sale in, in Thailand, and it goes on sale uh, Southeast Asia uh, a little bit, little bit later. And it will also be offered in Japan in 2024. And, and so it, it wouldn't look out of place in the in North America. Th- so that's exactly what I was about to say. Is that obviously Mitsubishi has a presence in the United States? I understand there's the chicken tax that's going to add twenty five percent to this vehicle's price, and it's I- I'm going to be PG here and say it's bull pucky that it's, the it's... chicken tax still exists in the year of our Lord yeah. twenty twenty three because it shouldn't, but. Assuming it didn't exist, this seems like a fine truck to sell here. It seems like for a lot of people, this would fulfill their needs. Not everyone. Mm-hmm. Some people need a Ford 2500 or Silverado 24. You know, there are people that need a bigger truck, but 
if it weren't for the bull pucky chicken tax, this seems like it would work, right? I mean, I I feel like I have to wonder if we're seeing maybe I should put this a different way. This truck feels like it could fit in the North American market right now and it's designed for markets not North America. But I wonder if that's in the backs of their minds. You know, people at Nissan, uh, designers at Mitsubishi thinking, you know, if we want to take it over there, if if we suddenly hear, hey, we have to have this, is it plug and play ready to go? I don't know. That's just just pure 100,000 percent speculation yeah but but I, know. but I feel like this truck could fit in right now in north america well mitsubishi hasn't sold a truck here in forever and they yeah, desperately but they did any... that's the thing they have i, I almost and i almost bought one guys the, the, they just need something to sell that people are actually going to buy though and americans mm-hmm. buy trucks so like this would be a very easy way for them to to try for some market share if it's something they wanted to do yeah. Um and and I just wonder if if that's in the backs of of their minds as they're going forward. Uh but yeah, the Mitsubishi how much, Triton. How much is that? the existing Frontier share with the Navara? Do you guys know? Oh boy, I don't I off don't the top know. of my head. Sorry. I cuz I'd be curious to see if they could adapt the North American plant in Mississippi that builds the Frontier to also build a truck for Mitsubishi, you know, using as Kola pointed out that <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. As Kola pointed out, um, that the L200 has Mitsubishi engineering in it. I wonder if they could integrate some of that into the <coughs> facility in Mississippi to build Mitsubishi a truck. Yeah, no, but Brett, I, d- this is a discussion you and I have never had. So if you disagree with me, I'm happy to have this discussion with you. To me, it feels like we are past the point where saying foreign market built pickup trucks shouldn't be offered in the united states because that's essentially the way the law that works works now because of the chicken tax that eisenhower imposed that you have to add 25 percent to their value and it just makes it prices them out of the market yeah i feel like we're past that to me and if someone wants to disagree with me and give me an argument against that i'll listen to them but yeah I'm not there. Oh, we, 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 yeah, we should be, we should be totally past that. But, uh, uh, to, to keep it rambling about cars, we'll just well, say no, we're rambling. Yeah. But, okay. Rambling about cars as opposed to Deal. topics other than cars. We'll just say Mitsubishi. We really hope that, uh, that this truck works for you and it works well enough that you'll yeah. offer it in North America because, yeah, guys. I was very close to buying a Mighty Max back in the 90s. Yep. I found so, I found a little one at the dealership actually that I worked at. It was just a little two-wheel drive, five-speed manual truck and it was just a blast to drive. So that's that's my Mitsubishi story. So I think if it's okay with you Smith, we will skip our S2000 story and go to our 1 million dollar challenge story. Is that okay? Well, let's I tell you what, I mean let's just touch on it really quick because the, okay, this I, I think okay. I, I think yep, it's, yep, it's yep. something worth mentioning. Um and okay. we can just spend a minute or two quick. on it. Um yeah. I mean the long story short is okay, we've heard another rumor and and this time that this report comes from Car Magazine in the UK, which is a fairly reputable source. It's why it is. Uh, it is it's why we it's why we looked into it and um unfortunately we haven't been able to get anything from honda beyond no. um just just oh hey we're excited for the future you know the <laughs> and and i understand that stuff but i mean i mean the report here is that honda is planning something for its 75th anniversary and it could be some sort of s2000 and, and here's here's where it, it, it's a little interesting because we're hearing S2000 revival or S2000 successor. So it may be an S2000. It may just be a spiritual successor to the S2000. Don't know on those fronts, but they're saying that they have sources in their side of the industry that are saying it's happening. Um, 
and it will be electric. And that's pretty much the extent of the rumor. But anytime we hear rumors about S2000, they capture our attention. And I think they capture the attention of a lot of people. And in fact, I know they do because the reason we're talking about it is we were watching our traffic numbers on this article blow up today. Um, and, and I mean, that, that's the, that's the crux of the rumor. Like I said, there's not a whole lot there, but if I could, I would like to just spark a very short discussion. Does, does an S 2000 make sense as an EV? And I'm not saying this. Yes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this to, to be a detractor of EVs because I'm not. But one of the defining characteristics of the S2000 was that just gloriously high revving, naturally aspirated four cylinder engine. Do you lose that gloriousness? Is, did I say that right? Do you no. lose that? Do you lose that appeal if you go with an electric S2000? No, because an electric motor revs to umpteen <laughs> thousand RPM. But it's not That's the fun. same, Bruce. You know, it's not the same. It's if I were a marketing person, I bet I could spin it to be the same thing. As long as you keep the weight down and you keep it to be a engaging vehicle to drive something, you know, what if, and we know nothing about this, this is totally on Chris Bruce right now. What if you did an EV with a stupid, insane red line and a manual transmission? You know, what if you did something like that? That would still be engaging to drive. That would be a proper successor to the S2000. You know, it's. But you don't really have red line with an EV. So, it just it just spins faster. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> it, it does, uh, no, you're right. No, I can't picture just, there. <laughs> it just spins faster. I, I've yep. heard from more than one person, though, that um, I've never driven an S2000. So this is purely like third hand information. But my brother owned one for a little while. And then a friend of mine um, has had has had like very nice. He had a S2000 CR for a little while, which is like mm. the Ooh. best. Yeah. The best. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of these people said that like the high RPM screaming is a little bit overrated and that like when you're just kind of trying to use it like a car, it's a pain in the butt because there's not. Oh work. yeah. So, it's, it's a, it's a total pain. I have had the pleasure of driving them and I almost bought one. And instead I, well, what we were talking about earlier, I bought an O3 SVT Cobra. Um, and I, but I was cross shopping those two because I, I wanted a, just a fun to drive small convertible and they're like opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, and yeah, the, the S 2000 does not make sense has just a, a drive me around car because you really have to get it up there to really enjoy it. But man, well, I enjoyed kinda... it every time. So, you, so you did have a good time just like screaming it up to red line. I, I was, I was addicted as hell to that red line. I just okay. wanted to stay. I just, you know, I, I just wanted to go from like five to 8,500 constantly. That's all I wanted. Slow back down. Then. You know, just constantly. I loved it. So I, I, that's why I'm asking because I could be a little, I could be a little colorblind here. I mean, that's what people say. They say that just like revving that thing to, to, you know, high heaven is a really enjoyable experience. Two of the people that I know who have actually owned them have said that it's like, eh, like you, you get, you get nice tired of it after there. a while. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I kind of think that an EV would solve that problem, you know, perfectly. I, I, to, to Chris Bruce's point, if they can oh. keep the weight down and if they can maintain it as like a lightweight, enjoyable roadster feel with all of a sudden now you've got instantaneous torque. Yeah. Well, real quick, I want to say, Cola, I've agreed with you tonight. I've disagreed with you tonight. And now I'm back on your side tonight. Mustang Mach-E haters are ignorant because the mustang is not just one vehicle smith you will agree with this because you are a mocky -E lover I, I didn't i didn't agree with it at first when i wrote that inflammatory ford loses mind fills frunk with shrimp i didn't agree then but you know after well, i drove was one a stupid th th PR that was that, that was a very stupid that. pr that thing I, I still stand by vehicle but, but yeah, I am totally on board. And in fact, Cola, since you are a new listener to Rambling About Cars, you are talking to one of 
six people in the world who love the Mustang too. <laughs> You're not wrong. There's there's six of us. We're the few. We're the proud. Um, and yes, the I, I am I am just fine with an electric four door Mustang crossover uh, after driving one. It it can make sense. It's a different experience. But you know what? Driving a seventy three Mach one is a very different experience from driving a seventy eight Mustang two Cobra, which is very different from driving. Um, a 90 LX five liter convertible, which Brett is very, very, very different from driving a 2024. So yeah, lots of room, lots of room in that universe. Are we ready for, are, are we ready for the cheap car challenge now? Guys? I was waiting for Brett to respond to that. He didn't. So no, I, yeah, <laughs> our, I have been, I've been fine with the GT with the Mach-E since the beginning. I don't really think there's anything wrong with it at all. I, a name is just a name, you know? Yep. Holy crap, guys. Cola, I love the Mustang too as well. Okay, seven. Seven, welcome to the family. There you go. So, the rule. Cheap car challenge time. And the, and yeah, this is a very, very different cheap car challenge. Bruce, you were about to explain it, so I'll shut up. cheap car challenge ever, ever like this in... 134 34 episodes. episodes generally the cheap car challenge is supposed to be for a car that anyone could conceivably own it's generally a thousand dollars five thousand dollars i think we pushed it maybe to ten thousand dollars once it, but that was like a one-time thing this time this time the cheap car challenge is for one million, million dollars. dollars. One and, million dollars. A million isn't is, much much money these days, right? And that is because we are looking at the cars, all of the cars for sale at this year's Monterey Car Week. So that there means are RM many options. That means Goodings. That means Meekum. That means what else am I missing? Um, there's one I'm particularly missing. Bottoms. Bottoms, that's the one. Bottoms. Yeah. I mean, there there are a plethora of auctions, and of course, mid August on the Monterey Peninsula, a million bucks is a cheap car. <laughs> I mean, Sadly, it is. It, it, it Disgustingly, kinda, it is. It kinda is. I mean, if you look through the, if you look through, the, to be fair, if you look through those auction listings, um, I mean, you'll you'll find lots of cars for a hundred grand, um, and up. You don't really see much under a hundred grand. Um, a couple, I bull, but not I, real. I, I, there are a handful, but th- there, no. there are there are a handful. So that's sort of the context for this cheap car challenge. One million dollars. My favorite Wait, thing um, about this cheap car challenge was usually when you do these challenges, you have a slider on your classified ad that you your classified page that you can like limit how high you want the price to go. With this one, it was like fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> 40 million dollars and so like to, <laughs> to slide it down to like get the maximum to a million you had like this much of the bar was available to you it was insane it was so depressing i, I, I want to call out our buddy group of fbc here uh this is the cheap car challenge for zuckerberg elon and bezos when they're all drunk texting and bravo man yeah and, exactly and then right. and then the next morning one of them was like wait wait I, I bought I bought an alpha what? <laughs> Why did I pay that? What did I really do? How do you think I feel? I bought some weird Isuzu I'd never heard of. <laughs> you know, so but the, the funny no, the other funny thing is we've looked at this list. There are cars. There was specifically a Jaguar C type. I wanted it was selling for three million dollars and I had to cut it out of this list because I'm like, oh, I can't afford that according to the rules. So right. No well, Jag C type for me. And and speaking of the rules, we discussed this ahead of time. The the vehicle, it it's any one vehicle under a million dollars. Yes. But it's just one vehicle, and obviously yes, it's, uh, it's one. It's under a million because otherwise, you know, because Bruce and I were discussing this. I would just find every eighties car that was selling for 50 or 60 grand and buy like, <laughs> and buy like a gazillion. Um, 
Yep. So I, I promise I obeyed the rules. Um, would would you guys like me to go first? If you want to, yeah. Please. If you're all set, I'm okay. Ready for it. Well, well, let me uh, let me see if my screen share is gonna work this time because last time it it didn't work very well. So, like I said, I followed the rules. If it doesn't, um, so it to me, and I'll so so it. this now okay. th- this. This is a 72 Ferrari 365 GTS 4 Daytona Spider. Yeah. It is one of two black with the tan leather. And if anybody grew up in the 80s, you know Miami Vice. I this know. is the car that Sonny Crockett drove. And I didn't yeah. know there was Thanks, actually. Johnson. I didn't know there was actually only two legit cars made like this. Now, in it black, does, which is it what does, you have to say, because they made multiple convertibles. That, well, not multiple. They made. I think literally a dozen convertibles, but in black, two, two, two. two. Now, it does have an estimated range of two point eight to three point two million. But hold on, I know we said one what million. The, you no, no, the no, hell, no, 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 no. When this auction starts, the first thing I'm going to say, holy crap! Don Johnson and Philip Michael Thomas are outside. It's a Miami Vice reunion. Everybody that's going to be bidding on this car. They're bidding you know. on this car because it's Crockett's car. They're out, man. They're they're no, out to see the Miami Vice not. reunion. I'm You're throwing my bid down. Liar. I'm I'm stealing this car is, for is, for one million dollars. Is there a reserve on this auction, Chris? Because your million dollars might not get you that car if they've got a reserve going. I I, I didn't look that close. Come on, guys. <laughs> get out of here. I'm I'm. Oh, okay. Somebody else go then. I'll 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 find another pick. Sheesh. Okay. Well, no. I'm, that that I'm was a perfectly go good. That's a perfectly good plan. But that's okay. That's okay. I'm a team player here. You guys go ahead. Mine is well within. Well, well within is an academic statement. Mine is within the price range, and that is a paint to sample nine nine three nine eleven Porsche Turbo S. Oh, that's so this boring man. and predictable. No, it's not. Well, that's kind of rad. This man had it paint to sampled to the let me pull it up here. Oh, the 917 and 935 that he owned. Uh, estimated value is 750,000 to 950,000 dollars. So, theoretically, hey, my million will buy this car. It's a paint to sample 993 911 Turbo S fight me like i like tell these me. cars i don't understand why they're million dollar cars well exactly no, the normal ones aren't it's that this one is paint to sample that's not those aren't stickers that's paint and i saw this car too and i thought oh that's pretty neat but it's like yeah. I, I i i don't i don't see the price for this if I were to buy God, that car, come I, on. No, I no, would no, constantly, no. dude. You're arguing for a million dollar nine nine three. Yes, I. Ah uh, man, with so, with with nineties graphics on it. You know how loath I am to agree with Christopher Smith after he besmirched the nine five nine a couple weeks ago. But did you see I, there's one for sale that's going for about a million? I almost picked it just to just to a, a just to flip to a you a finger. Five, I saw it. I um, I would I would do for a million dollars I'd happily do a nine five nine that that tracks to me that feels you know in the but realm of billionaire appropriate. I, I gotta say this again: those aren't stickers. Porsche painted those colors on. Them. Well, I could paint a poop emoji on there, but yeah. it's still not. I, it doesn't not, doesn't make it worth that much money. I'm not saying that like it's neat. Is best. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. It's not, I, lo- I love the blue. It's not tripling the value need, though. I don't totally. Okay. I, I some, can respect that opinion. I can respect that. I'm not still, if I was going to maximize my fantastical a million dollars, <clears throat> this is the one I think I would get. And there, I do have a like a second example. <laughs> I do have a, a backup, but I think I would go with this. Group FBC is nailing it again. I'm getting Sunoco vibes. It is Why now is that the, a bad thing? It's the Sunoco 911. Because yeah. it's not a Gulf 911, is it? It's a Sunoco 911. And That's the 911 you get when you can't afford the Gulf. 
Thank goodness but it's this not man could have. It's paint. It's not stickers. <laughs> damn it! Some <laughs> some Porsche, some poor German in Zuffenhaus and like set it all out and put all that paint on and made it look perfect in 1996, probably. You know, and and I'll I'll give you like 300 grand for it. 20 bucks, best okay. I can do. Okay. Well, Ted Adam Grease on your side. Good. I feel okay. you, Bruce. Paint the sample stripes. The hey, this the stripes are cool. I dig it. Yeah. I just okay. man, that it, it just it feels that's, like it feels like a lot. Yeah, that's the okay. thing. Like not besmirching the car one little bit. Cool car, neat spec, very interesting choice that the guy made to have it match his race cars. Can't can't fault that one bit. Okay. There so okay. Next next person's up. Brett, um, I think that's you. You sent us the link. Bruce, do you have it? Or if nope. not, I have it right here. It's nope. just in private chat. I, I, I can also try and present, but if you guys No, 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 it. no, no. I got it right here, man. You got it right there? Okay. Oh. Take, her, take her away. I wow. saw this you car, too. You were went home, man. And, and I was <laughs> tempted, man, because this thing is hot. This was tell a... It, tell us what it a, is, Brett. Like, seat of the pants, 1938 Bugatti Type 57 Roadster in the style of Gangloff. I don't know what any of those words mean. This was a That's pure, a like, beauty. It, it, when it I is. scrolled past it, it made a funny feeling happen in the base of my belly, and I decided <laughs> I needed to get it. In the base of your pants, I think you mean, but sure. yeah. I was trying to keep it family appropriate, but yeah, yeah. Something That's funny the PG-13. There are a lot of things in, in your pants. And it just, yep. So I don't know what it is. I, I it's, it's the got, 30. Guess, that's what it is. I think it has the straight eight end of the Bugatti straight eight. So, you know, it's going to yeah. make an absolute insane 1930s Grand Prix scream. But uh, I just like really love the uh, the vents all over the hood. I think it just looks so, so bitchin'. Uh, You're yeah, not wrong. It's, it's and just also the vent. I I can't imagine these are functional. I have to imagine these are just a stylistic thing because the vent along the side sills yeah. match the vents along the hood. Oh yeah, yeah. I and for an estimated for selling me. price of three hundred thousand dollars less than that nine eleven turbo. I guess and guess who's gonna just get all the attention. It's it's not the Sunoco. There's gonna be some. There's gonna be someone. In the, it's not in the, the Sunoco. Back of the cars and coffee going, but they're painted. They're not. They're not safe. <laughs> if you have to explain your car, and that that just speaks for itself. I saw that car and I was very tempted, um, just because I'm a huge fan of the '30s. The just that whole era yeah. of automotive. That whole pre-war era of yeah. automotive design is just flamboyant and extravagant and i love every single aspect mm -hmm. of it the fenders the racing cockpit that i am building right now is going to be styled in this manner right. once it's once it's all said and done so yep bravo that's a great choice um there was, guys i, I oh. sorry sorry go ahead no, I was just going to say, I, I got to sit, I wasn't a Bugatti, it was a Tabo Lago last year. I got to sit in one at um, Pebble Beach, and it was like, just one of those like top 10 pinch me, this isn't actually happening moments yep. in my life. I, I remember just, I remember you talking about that. Fabulous, fabulous cars. Now, I feel like well, I lost here, if I'm honest. Like, <laughs> I feel like you guys both picked better than me. Well, and, I do, I do have, I do have something that actually fits within the rules. If, I want to see guys, Smith's. Rule rule following choice. If 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 you okay. guys can permit me, um, go ahead. Yeah, and we're here. and I'm I'm actually torn. So that the, there's going to be some quick fire things here. Um, we're going to start with the Toyota 2000 GT because, Ooh. damn, I've always loved these cars. Well, that's got to be one million exactly. They they right? don't come up as estimate of eight hundred thousand to one million. So it's right yeah. there. It's a '67 okay. Toyota 2000 that. GT. It fits the rules. It's red. It I, I love red. I am scared to death to buy one and drive one because I feel like I would love it right away. And then I would be really sad because it's a Toyota. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's, I mean, when this car came out, it wasn't necessarily designed to be the super awesome extravagant no. thing. It was designed to just be a fun sports car. And it's epic, and I'm scared to buy it. 
because I'm afraid. I mean, what do they say? Don't meet your heroes, right? Smith, you and I have had this discussion before. Is that what three years after this, four years after this, the Dotson 240Z arrives and it's basically the same idea for it's it's very a similar fraction of the price. But I love the way the and, 2000 yeah, GT I, looks. The yeah, styling yeah, is yeah, better. Yeah. It, it's it's got the right sounds, but I'm scared to death that I would get just either bored or just a little tired of it too quick. So what I did find was my legit dream car. Okay. A 1935 oh. Auburn 851 goddamn boat tail speedster that is gorgeous. Look at this thing. I can't just just look at it. Those Super. were are those supercharged as well? That that is a supercharged Lycoming straight eight engine, oh, two straight, seater, eight six. Okay. And uh, and this is at Meekum, which I apologize, I forgot to send you guys the link to Meekum. It's did. the only. How many Ferraris did you guys go through? Oh, pages and on, pages. on these Dozens? auction links. How many Auburns? I found. Two. A, a, a handful yeah. like and this is the only four, boat tail six. speedster i found go to the money um, shot show the boat tail it's 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 six hundred fifty thousand to eight hundred thousand yeah. estimate i honestly thought it was You're... going to be higher um yeah inline mm. eight cylinder it's just such a, the the presence of this car is just gorgeous my racing cockpit is actually going to be based on an Auburn boat tail speedster because I sort of have oh, that God. slant up by the cockpit already. I'm going to build just a little boat tail back. Mm -hmm. I was trying to source some actual Auburn parts, like an Auburn supercharged badge or something. And just, I mean, just those parts alone are just, just ridiculously expensive. Well out of your price range. <laughs> but uh, I mean, no, yeah, that's it's a fantastic looking car. Yeah, it's that, just the sleek not... back. This is black with red. It fits the bill, the that hood ornaments. I mean, this this is yeah. this is legit one of my dream cars. So I was happy to find it for well under a million dollars. The pipes on the side and everything. Those it, coiled you know. pipes are such a mood. I love the look of those coiled pipes on everything that they're in. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it and, kills and, me. And I'm buying flex pipe to put on the racing cockpit. So I will have a, I will have a front with the with the pipes coming out. It's probably going to look like a like the worst Ferrari Fiero body kit you've ever seen, but damn it, it's it's going to be mine. And That's in right. fact, this is at such a bargain. I know we're only supposed to pick one, but that leaves me room to buy this 1999. No, 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 no. We got I'm, one. No, no, I'm not one, breaking the rules. I'm not breaking the rules, but it leaves me enough to buy this 99 Ferrari 550 Marinello for 200 to 250 grand. Okay. This is the which, whose line is in any way the rules. Of podcasts. Which, which, which is also, I, I'm not, I'm just saying, theoretically, if we could, I theoretically have enough money left over from the Auburn to buy this, this 99 Ferrari 550 Marinella, which I've always loved my entire life. So I could have something newer with a V12 that I know I wouldn't get tired of with the say, Auburn bow tail that I know I would never get tired of. My friend. Uh, I have a tour show project car in the garage. <laughs> Bring it. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. What, what's it going to do? Oh, I, am I going to scrape my fingers trying to change a crankshaft position sensor? Oh, guess what? I've been there. Jeez. Oh, okay. What are your Brent, picks, everybody? Podcast at motor1.com. This show or it'll go on forever. <laughs> Brett, please. Where can folks follow you? Where <laughs> Brett, take us out of this damn show. <laughs> <laughs> the stripes are painted, though. Come on. That might be my new like Twitter bio, I think. Uh, the, stripes the stripes are painted. Are painted. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought it was cool. I still think it, it's cool. The it fact is. That, like, it someone... is. That some, some Stuttgarter craftsman has just been spending hours and hours just painting those or he it's did, and it's I, a thing I, of I hope he's retired now, and he's in some bar in Stuttgart, and he's drinking his masa, and he's like, "I had to paint these damn stripes every I, day." I want him to hear the podcast. I hope he, I hope he comes across this podcast someday, and he thinks <laughs> Chris Bruce is the only man in that room with some taste. Right. Yes, I'm the only man that appreciates you, Mister Porsche Painter. Ha, ha, ha.
paint a spec. Brett, what do you have going on? Um, you've uh, got this. You got this. The Lexus LX project that you're yeah. writing about in Motor One. Plus, you're plugging just just constant con- content into Motor One.com. What do you got going on? Uh, well, you should definitely go check out the uh, the Mustang um, GT review that we just published yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a video to go along with that as well. And then um, next yep. week, you're going to see my colleague, our friend Jeff Perez's review of the Dark Horse going live. So be sure to check that out. Um, okay. I'm on Twitter. Uh, threads and Instagram as Brett underscore T underscore Evans. So if you want to check in there, feel free. You're by a all means. now, right? You had threads, right? V- very intermittently, but yeah, same handle, pretty much the same content. Right. So. Because threads and Instagram are kind of yep. sort of children. Yeah. And, yeah, and exactly. I'm there now as well. Uh, Hunter yeah. VF V E E F. And by the way, you can catch all of those links to everything that Brett just talked about right in the YouTube description of this very podcast. They're there right now, along with links to the other stuff we talked about here on this episode. Yep. All good things. Yep. Um, I will say, so yeah, um, all the socials, well, not all the socials, most of the socials, I am uh, auto writer, A-U-T-O-W-R-I-T-E-R-227. That's uh, Twitter, Instagram, threads so if anyone wants to follow me but yeah we always love getting any comments to motor one you know Mo- motor one com on youtube motor one com on twitter what motor one com instagram right yeah mm-hmm. yep. yeah very cool the only the uh, only different the only different one is motor one youtube stop on um youtube and TikTok. oh you're right you're right, you're right. Yep. yeah we're on tiktok um, as well yeah, yeah. But yeah, we love getting all your comments. All of I just like comments, honestly. Like I and emails all the time. Email podcast at motor one dot com. And don't forget, we've got the emails. We love getting the emails. Yep. Um, So yeah, all that's fun stuff. Um, We're gonna sign off now, Brett. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope we didn't take up too much of your time. No, this Um, was an awesome conversation. Yeah. But otherwise, good afternoon, good morning, because I know Grupa FBC, he's in Australia, and it's morning time for him. And I hope there we have other Australian or New Zealander or whatever is in that time zone, listeners. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, or good night these days. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that you guys decide to spend time with us because you could do it in so many different ways. You could watch movies or video games or who the hell knows what. You could be spending time with family or human beings. Like, what crazy people are that? Um, So, yeah, we love it. Um, uh, So I just appreciate it so much. And we're going to be signing off. So bye-bye, everybody. Take care. We'll see you. Have a good night.